Well, hello, everybody, and good day. I hope, first of all, that you're all well. I hope that you can hear me. Uh, and uh, I'm just getting ready to start. We will, I think, uh, have perhaps one or two more people join in the next uh, minute or two. But we're not many today, so it's an opportunity to say hello to everybody. Uh, Catherine will be helping me through the session today. And uh, Catherine, what I'm going to suggest is that after I've said hello, uh, that you might just like to introduce who else is with us on this, uh, who's joined to help us, and also to explain the process that we're going to use for collecting uh, different, uh, different ideas. I'd like to just specially greet uh, um, Gawaha. I can see you standing there. It looks like you're sort of in a doorway somewhere. Nice to see you. Also, greetings to Annie. Hello to Annie Feltham. To Chris Langdon. Miles Breeden. Joe Nichols, uh, expect not far away. Sarah Phillips. Hello. And then to John Atkinson, Miriam Leal from our team. And then uh, uh, Ad Spikers. Arnie Cartridge, hello. Lovely to see you. And Claudia. And Beat Meyer. Simon James. And other colleagues. Peter Hebert, thank you for joining us as well. Uh, nice that you're with us. And then also to my partner Florence, uh, Samir, hello. Eric Butlin, Tessie, nice to see you, welcome. And uh, and others will, I'm sure, join. Fruzan, thank you for being with us. Special greetings to Edie Lush from Global Goals Cast and uh, Mike Oreskes from Global Goals Cast. It is special. We will invite um, uh, Catherine to talk about you and also to talk about uh, the illustration department. Over to you, Catherine. Hi, everybody. Happy Friday. Happy OOB Day. Um, it's lovely to see you all. Welcome. Just a couple of notes before we jump in to, to David's thoughts and insp insp inspiring making sense. This is how I think of it. The first is that I want to say thanks to the Global Goals Cast team um, for being here. Fantastic to have you. Really looking forward to you guys uh, featuring some of, of the updates that David gives. Edie, Mike, Simon, fantastic that you're here. For everybody else, just to remember that some of this material today will be turned into a podcast. If for any reason you do not want to be part of that podcast, or if there's something that you say that you want to make sure isn't included, send me a direct message in the chat or an email. I'll make sure my email address is there, um, just so that that we make sure that we we follow your desire there. I also want to say thanks to Live Illustration UK for supporting us as they always do with their incredible artists. Today we have Josh Knowles. Hi Josh. Hi everybody. Great to be here. Looking forward to seeing your drawing at halftime, your illustration, pardon me, at halftime. And uh, with that, I think let's get on to the good stuff. David. Thanks very much indeed. Those of you who've got a uh, computer and who can see uh, 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 what's on my screen uh, will have a chance to look at once again the graph that shows total number of cases that's the area that's colored and then total number of deaths and that's the black line the weekly number of reported cases uh, the numerical scale is on the left hand uh, y axis and the number of deaths is on the right hand y axis. The colours tell you where the cases are coming from, six different regions of the World Health Organization. Now I've been showing these graphs uh, at these briefings at intervals and if you can see my pink mouse pointer it's showing you that there have been some definite periods when the numbers of cases have been higher and then there have been periods when the numbers of cases have been lower, higher and then lower. Now if you look at it overall it's not really 
presenting in distinct waves, but there is most definitely a, a variability in the numbers of cases, and it's not exactly seasonal. Uh, what we can see is that there was a definitely a peak of cases globally in November, December, January, February 2020 to 2021. There was another peak in May and June 2021, and there was another peak really that reached its uh, zenith in September 2021. And since September, there's been quite a drop in total cases, though there's a, just a, one of nasty suggestions that is just coming back up again now. And because this is accumulation of reported cases from all over the world, we, we probably have to go inside the numbers to see what's going on. So the big increase that happened at the end of uh, uh, last year, beginning of this year, that big increase was um, uh, due to uh, a lot of cases in the Europe and the uh, Americas. So that's in the green and the uh, yellow areas. And that um, bump uh, happened uh, and then subsided. And then in May, June, there was a large increase in the number of cases in Indian subcontinent, and that pushed the totals up. And then in September, there was a large increase in cases again in Europe, but also in what's called the Pacific. So that was Japan and more, a little bit also increase in Africa, and that pushed cases up. And then they've come down again, but you notice this little uptick around now. And this uptick is coming from Europe mainly. There is most definitely an increase in the numbers being reported from Europe. Uh, I'm going to turn off my screen share. Thank you. Uh, you'll have to tell me afterwards whether showing you graphs works and whether my way of demonstrating them is meaningful to you. Please let's... Uh, hear about that later and I'm very very keen to get it right. So increased numbers really starting to appear in Europe. What's going on? Well most of the increase in numbers of cases in Europe is coming from countries in the east of Europe. There's also a, a quite a large number of cases being reported from the UK, particularly England. The cases in Eastern Europe are associated with quite heavy pressure on hospital services and an increase in mortality. It's particularly much in uh, Russia. And the general feeling is that this increase in cases in Eastern Europe and Russia is associated with large numbers of people who are susceptible, they've not had COVID, they've not been vaccinated, and so they are easily infected. They're being infected primarily with the Delta variant, uh, and um, that's leading to hospitals being quite overloaded in, in population centres, in Eastern Europe and uh, former Soviet Union. Uh, it's also leading to uh, quite a lot of uh, people uh, having long COVID. It's not a good situation having this virus moving around and lots of people infected. In Western Europe, there are increases being reported in France and in some other uh, Western European countries, a bit in Belgium and, and some in the Netherlands, uh, they're not associated with such heavy pressure on hospital services and that's thought to be due to the beneficial impact of vaccination which is making the incidence of severe disease and deaths much much lower than would be expected for the case numbers. Essentially vaccination is providing an immunological shield of, of people. The level of cases in the community in uh, France, in Spain, in Italy, 
and also in Germany and Switzerland is thought to be lower than the level of cases in England. And the reason for that seems to be that in England the reliance is primarily on vaccination and vaccination alone to prevent spread. There's relatively low levels of wearing of masks and practice of physical distancing in uh, England, actually lower than there is in France and in uh, other countries inside the European Union on the Western end. Uh, that's because as far as we can tell the British policy is pretty much relying on vaccines alone whereas the policy in other Western European countries is what I call vaccines plus and I just want to stress what the plus is. The plus is is regular and systematic wearing of well-fitted face masks. Increasingly the focus is on surgical masks rather than homemade masks because they can be properly put over the nose and also uh, uh, padded in so that they're well fitting. In addition in Western Europe as well as talking about physical distancing there's increasing emphasis on the importance of avoiding the exhaled air of others. So that as well as talking about physical distancing, Western European leaders are describing why physical distancing is so important and recommending people to do everything possible not to inhale the droplets that come out of the mouths of others. There's also increasing interest throughout Europe in the importance of regular regular replacement of air through ventilation systems in which there is adequate filtration as well as adequate throughput. It does appear that there have been some quite major incidents of the spread of the virus when with very very small particles being born in air carried by the air uh, and in order to prevent this airborne spread the nature of the ventilation system and the filters used and so on need attention. Now this focus on avoiding breathing other people's air and therefore inhaling droplets and particles that others have breathed out really does seem to be important as an adjunct to the use of vaccination in preventing severe illness and death. One colleague who's on this, uh, on this briefing is an engineer who has made uh, detailed studies of these issues and I'm hopeful that when I finish my remarks we will be able to hear from him uh, and certainly I think his observations are really helpful. I think we, we both agree and of course the WHO is very strong on this that the use of vaccination alone as a primary control strategy is not to be recommended but vaccination plus well-fitting face masks avoiding the exhalations of others decent ventilation are all key and they should be supplemented by the necessary capacity to be able to detect people with COVID and to be able to help them to isolate so they don't infect others and to be able to trace their contacts and to isolate their contacts. That's what we call public health and there's absolutely no excuse for governments to underplay the importance of public health in dealing with an infectious disease. So we require people to be able to adapt their behaviour, public health services 
to be able to support them in interrupting transmission. And then if you do get a cluster and then a spike of disease, it may be necessary to intervene with an integrated approach among multiple organizations brought together at the local level, ideally under the supervision of the district health officials, in order to undertake the necessary extra work to prevent an outbreak deteriorating. And that's when movement restrictions may become necessary. Localized movement restrictions for as short as possible. In the WHO, we do not recommend the use of lockdowns as the primary means of controlling COVID-19. Lockdowns are very damaging to society, particularly to poorer people. And the indiscriminate use of lockdowns is not desirable. Instead, we encourage all governments to invest in building partnerships with people to apply personal protective measures and also we encourage governments to invest in basic public health services for detection of those who are infected and support for isolation as well as for dealing with outbreaks through localized and carefully applied movement restrictions when necessary. I'm going on about this at some length because there are some countries that appear not to be encouraging the wearing of face masks, physical distancing, hygiene and ventilation. There are some countries that appear not to be prioritising public health services as part of the effort to reduce the threats imposed by COVID. And that's odd because we have so much evidence now that if different interventions are combined, you get the best result. And so even if you are concentrating on the use of vaccine as a way of reducing suffering and death, you should also put in place the other measures because taken together, they will reduce risk. But if you just use one or two of them, then the reduction in risk is going to be much less. Vaccines are amazingly useful, very highly effective vaccines available. They're amazingly useful in reducing the suffering and death associated with COVID. If they're administered to people at high risk, particularly people who are working in the health system, people who've got intimate contact with others, perhaps in, their, their, in the care sector, people who are old, who have a high risk if they get COVID of death, people who've got diabetes or cardiovascular disease who also tend to suffer. All those groups are ideal candidates for vaccines and for regular vaccination in order to reduce their risk of death. And the re reduction in risk thanks to vaccination is extraordinary. But these vaccines that are currently being used in Western Europe and in many other parts of the world were not given emergency use listing as the means to end the pandemic. They were given emergency use listing by the World Health Organization because they stopped death. And that means that we really want to stress to you and stress to everybody that the right strategy for dealing with this pandemic is a composite strategy that includes vaccination, but doesn't rely on vaccination alone. We've been making this point very strongly to governments throughout Western Europe in the last few weeks. And we think there is some heed being paid to our remarks. In the UK, we don't talk about plan A and plan B where plan A is vaccinate everybody and plan B is introduce masking, vaccine passports and working from home. We say plan A plus is what you need, which is vaccination plus face masks 
plus distancing and hygiene uh, and um, and also uh, hygiene and ventilation. Now, I'd like to spend a moment or two on the global situation. I want to refer particularly to what's happening in uh, different regions of the world. The first is to say there's enormous disparity still in access to vaccines. 70% of the vaccines that have been administered to date have been administered in high income countries. 2% have been administered in low income countries. Already now, three times more doses are being given as boosters in high income countries than are being offered as primary vaccination in low income countries. We have this amazing scheme for moving vaccine to low income countries, which is negotiated deals with vaccine manufacturers at a good cost for vaccines to go everywhere where they're needed. It's called COVAX. COVAX is not getting the supplies it needs in order to vaccinate the world's health workers in order to start moving vaccine into poor countries as well. And so a lot of effort now is going into trying to persuade the leaders of rich countries to agree to defer receiving vaccines from the manufacturers for say two months in order that the newly, newly manufactured vaccines can go straight to COVAX and could go to poor countries. We'd prefer that system rather than donations. The trouble with donations is they're often donations of stock that has already been in storage in wealthy countries for some time. Uh, the disadvantage then is that the vaccines may be close to their expiry date. A donation of nearly expired vaccines is like a donation of stale bread. Yes, you might try to eat it, but it's an incredibly difficult thing to cope with because you have to eat it straight away. And the same with these nearly expired vaccines. They have to be used straight away. And that can be a real problem, especially with some of the vaccines that need to be kept very cold, like Pfizer and also like Moderna. So there's a serious effort in advance of the G20 meeting that starts this weekend to persuade wealthy nations yet again that they can afford to delay receiving vaccines. They can afford to go a bit slow on any program to vaccinate children. They can afford to go a bit slower on booster vaccinations for their adults and they can instead allow <clears throat> some millions of doses to go to poor countries so that they can just provide the very basic level of vaccination. It's still thought to be a political choice that's too difficult for the leaders of many rich countries. But in discussions this week, it looks as though there's the beginnings of some movement uh, and that is great. There are also some issues about the acceptance of vaccination when people are traveling. At the moment, there's a sort of gradation. It's generally believed that vaccines that are either against messenger RNA, the mRNA vaccines, or vaccines that are based on live virus, uh, are the most effective and that some of the other vaccines are less effective and that means that if somebody is vaccinated for example with a Sinopharm vaccine in Thailand has had two doses they may not be accepted for entry into Europe unless they have a further two doses of Moderna or AstraZeneca vaccine or Pfizer vaccine now this creates a, a, a kind of vaccine barrier 
that is affecting international travel, that is affecting international education, that's affecting trade, and of course that's co contributing to a great deal of international suspicion and frustration. It's, it's still a lot of work to try to get harmonization of vaccine requirements for travel, but I personally believe it is urgent. I hope that if the G20 do manage to move forward on vaccination this weekend, they will also initiate some work to harmonize vaccine certification. I'd like just to offer you some snippets that I'm picking up from around the world. Different things that I'm hearing from different groups, just to just give you some indication of what's happening. I think there's worries in India that after uh, several weeks of reduction in cases, that the numbers are building up again. Partly because of an increase in people's movements due to the Diwali festivals, festival of light. Some hospitals in India have observed a 20 to 25 percent increase in hospitalization last week. West Bengal in particular saw an increase after their version of the autumn festival, the Durga Puja. The Republic of Korea, however, they've seen a, a decline in numbers of cases after a difficult period. And with 72% of the population vaccinated, the authorities in Korea believe that there will be a possibility of returning to some kind of normal, normality. But my understanding is they will continue to use masks and other precautions for some time. Russia is showing the trend that we're also seeing in much of Europe, particularly in the East. And Russia has got movement restrictions in Moscow to try to curb the surge. And this is because of a substantial increase in the number of cases, a, a lot of people trying to get treatment in hospitals and vaccine hesitancy leading to uh, a low, uh, low level of immunity. Dominican Republic and other islands in the Caribbean and Central and our countries in Central America reporting uh, another rise and a new what they're calling the fourth wave with increased test positivity rates and using a mix of epidemiological and health indicators they really are concerned about what's happening in hospital and Russia has high vaccine hesitancy. Dominican Republic is still not in a situation where they've got the right level of vaccination that they believe to be necessary to prevent large numbers of cases building up. Romania is in a similar position to Russia with increased cases and there there's been uh, a, a number of other interventions they're doing uh, mandatory COVID-19 health passes where you have to show that you've been vaccinated to get into any public venue. So perhaps what I'm conveying to you, and I hope I am, is that the situation is not yet stabilised. We still have got the virus being transmitted in many parts of the world and it's still this pattern of declining numbers and then picking up again with a rapid surge and then declining and a rapid surge. And the size of the surge will be diminished if there's a high coverage of people with vaccination. But it's not a guarantee the vaccination at the moment. Firstly, you have to have a lot of people vaccinated to get sufficient immunity in the population to stop the spread. And not many countries have gone for total population vaccination. And the second anxiety is that new variants are appearing all the time. And it is a constant concern that these new variants sooner or later will be able to outwit the protection that results from vaccines. So we're saying to everybody and I'd like you to be passing the message on 
try to continue with all the precautions, the personal precautions, because after all, we're the solution to the problem, the problem being the virus. So personal precautions for people, public health services by governments to detect and then to isolate, and then capacity in countries to deal with outbreaks through prompt and rigorous integrated local action. And we'd very much like all leaders to be singing this song and to be sharing the same message because the one, one challenge that really does face the world at the moment is inconsistent messaging from leaders, which in turn leads to confusion and uncertainty among people and which in turn sometimes leads to kind of theories emerging that actually work against everybody being able to get on top of this virus. And it's a global problem affecting all nations. And our economist friends are telling us that poor countries have very limited reserves to protect their people against the effects of COVID. And therefore, we should do everything possible to help every country to get on top of this and that means good examples, particularly from those in positions of power in wealthier nations. Thank you, everybody. That's my briefing. And now I'd like to move to Catherine for a, a, a presentation of the of the picture and a, a introdu introduction to Josh. And then uh, I will invite you to come in with your comments. Hi everybody. Um, my my pleasure to be here with you at halftime. Um, lovely to see this illustration. Josh, maybe give us a little bit. Maybe I'll ask you. What's your favorite part so far? Um, hi there. Well, I haven't really had a chance to have a look at it yet. I've just been so busy scribbling. <laughs> um, I've just been trying to follow the conversation and uh, get some of these points in. Uh, but I'm very much picking up on this idea of vaccine plus. Um, it's a good sticky phrase. So at the top here, are these sort of four blue squares kind of in the middle, I've tried to kind of uh, lay out these, the vaccine, the face mask, social distance and hygiene and ventilation as being key to the best approach to uh, reduce risk around the virus. Um, and down here at the, uh, uh, at the uh, underneath the planet that I'm drawing, I'm drawing a, um, uh, a truck which is on its way with a um, uh, vaccine for uh, other nations from, um, from, the, from the more developed nations. So I'll be drawing that more as we go uh, to show how um, we can distribute the vaccine more fairly. So there's more to come, so stay tuned. Thanks so much. I really like that ventilation has clouds moving through it. Um, uh, that's a particularly nice way to illustrate that. Uh, David, there's the chat is, as always, super active. I think um, the point on travel were, were the, and, and vaccination requirements has really stimulated a bunch of people. Um, we also had a question on LinkedIn from Sarah Beatmeyer. So I hand back to you to guide us through the second half. Thank you very much indeed, uh, everybody. Uh, what I'd like to do is to uh, just offer space to one or two people to comment if they wish to. Um, I see Karen Kaplan, you're here. I think you're in New York because I recognize the picture behind you and uh, would be very pleased for you to reflect on what you're seeing in, uh, in your state and your city if you would like. I'd also be very keen to invite Sarah Phillips. Uh, I saw you but I, I've lost you now but if oh there you are you're you're there um, if you would like to come in I think you're on your phone. Any comments from yourself? Gawaha Atif if you would like that would be great and then um, also I, uh, Beat Maya we could come to you and uh, anybody else who would like to make any comments, please don't hesitate to do so and catch 
either my eye via uh, uh, well, by waving your hand or Catherine via the chat. I'm not really reading the chat. And um, I'm actually very keen to know whether or not what I'm talking about makes sense to you. Um, it's quite difficult right now because the 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 nature of the challenge is is continuing and it's difficult to get a fix on it. It's get difficult to get a global fix because the information on the global situation is a bit a bit light in many places, and um, the messages that are coming from multiple quarters are, are quite conflicting uh, uh, and even ideologically chinged so i'm okay if we do talk about some of the challenges of navigating this environment and uh, i want to continue to work with you on that because that's what i'm having to do all the time in my role as special envoy karen kaplan please hey there hi everyone um let's see uh in new york it's kind of uh, still the political game. If you are for the vaccines and um, for mask wearing and all the public health, then you're gung ho to get boosters. And if you're not, then you're not you're not on board. Um, it's election week here for us, and um, the police, fire department, and sanitation. Um, the majority of them, sixty five to seventy five percent, are vaccinated. But they have um, a union, uh, several unions that are kind of driving this small contingent, although it gets a ton of media attention, even though it's a really a small, small number. It's like 6,000 or 7,000 police um, out of more than 100,000 plus, uh, large of a force. Um, they're staging these rallies, but they're getting massive press attention. But um, today is a deadline date for when they were uh, the all city workers, 160,000 plus were told uh, you had to have at least one shot or and if you did get one shot, you could get $500 bonus in your check. And if you didn't get the shot, you had till Monday uh, to take a test or you're on unpaid leave. So since that mandate, actually, thousands of people have actually gotten vaccinated. Um, so there's bad press, although it's working. Um, and again, it's mostly political. Um, the other thing here that continues is violent school boards. And again, that's on political lines, um, arguing about things that don't have anything to do with COVID and saying absolutely ridiculous things like, you know, whatever. Not, I'm not gonna say they're conspiracy theories and stuff, but it's just taken on a very violent life of its own here. Um, and there are, are ele really important elections going on. And a lot of it has to do with COVID. If it's not COVID, it's COVID and race. Um, uh, not necessarily about the economy and opportunities. Um, so that's kind of the good and the bad of it. And um, it was also just a really exciting week for all things global. I'm sorry I missed your conversation um, with Strive Masiwa and uh, the UNICEF Innocenti conversation. I wanted to hear that, but at least I got to hear all the World Health Summit stuff and, it was, um, and the Africa CDC. That was really an amazing press conference with MasterCard this week. So impressive. And, uh, and the one thing I'll leave you with um, before I stop talking is if no one watched or if you missed, if you happen to miss the, the final keynote at the World Health Summit with um, the all-female uh, WHO Council on the Economics of Health for All, Mariana and Ilona and all of them, it is amazing. Well worth that hour and a half if you have time. Um, I've never fist pumped as much for an economics conversation <laughs> and health. So that's it from my end. Oh, wonderful. Uh, and just a tiny comment from me. It's very interesting, the vaccine mandates and then the use of passports to get into places and what that does to uh, compliance, isn't it? I mean, it's not easy. It's a very tricky area. Sorry, well, we well, we've had a, we've had a, a lessening. There was actually quite a number of violent attacks on hostesses and um, people at front entrances. Some of that has started to lessen, um, thankfully. Um, but it is it's still a confusing 
scenario. You know, you don't know whether you're supposed to wear a mask when you go in the salon or what you're supposed to do. It's just kind of a free for all, which is a shame. Thank you, Karen. And thank you for the uh, news from the World Health Summit and the work being done by the Africa CDC and the new African vaccine initiative that's being led out of Africa from the uh, African Union. It's so exciting. Thank you for sharing can I, that. Hmm? Can I just say one more thing and then I'll stop? Um, uh, there's been really amazing uh, writings about it this week, but um, the new head, well, the head of C CDC moving over to PEPFAR and building across um, the infrastructure of PEPFAR to, and their relationships along with CDC's relationships, this has the potential for Africa to really become, over a couple of years, really to become like the leader of the globe. I believe um, so. I yeah, can't so and the guy, a, his name is John Nkengasong. Yes, N -K -E -N -G -A -S -O -N -G. I always say it wrong. N K E N G A S O N G. He will, he will become. Um, well, he already is, but I think even more so, uh, a tower of strength uh, in public health, and and it will be on this platform of African solidarity, which is just amazing and and very inspiring. Yes, with a billion people, they can mm. flip the dime. Obviously, mm. the West didn't lead with COVID. Mm. So maybe the next pandemic will be led by Africa. Mm. And that billion person strong public health system that we can get right at the last mile. So I'm done. Thank you, Karen. Now let's go to Sarah Phillips, please. Hello. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. Just checking you can hear. Perfect. Outside. Yeah, Perfect. great. Yeah. Just cut me off because I'm outside if it goes funny in the background. Um, I'm from Nottingham, UK, and I, I've been coming a lot, but I haven't been recently. So it's a real treat to be here and to get a bit of understanding and, and that island of sanity um, that is here. So we've had the kind of the not the not masks and the just relying on the vaccines in the UK, like Dr. Navarro is saying, and I found that really frustrating and really difficult, to be honest. Um, well, the whole thing from that leadership point of view. But um, I did spot um, I did spot you on a Sky this week, Dr. Barrow, and that was really good. And there was a prompt to put masks on on the front benches in the budget, and and I noticed that happened. So I thought that was fantastic. Um, but yeah, so I'm in in Sheffield now. I've just come over to see Little Amal, who's a puppet that's going around and brought the children. We're just coming for the night, but we're outside and we tend to spend our times in open air and things like that and then I did notice that you do start to forget masking and I'm really into it you do start to see crowds and see that so it, it's it's interesting when you start seeing more masks and more behaviors that that prompts more and more not just role models when when they appear but you know that it's it, it prompts you and I think that having more masks around and I'm certainly doing that a lot more and, and trying to where, where even in open spaces, just, you know, putting masks on a little bit to remind people sometimes. Right. I don't know what else to do. It's a bit hopeless sometimes. But. Model the behavior, Sarah. I mean, you've done it on so many of the things in your professional life. That's how you are. And I think it, it, it really is important for those of us who believe that mask wearing is significant to actually do it and not to be uh, in any way intimidated not to do it, whether it's by friends or fellow workers or bosses or whatever. So I'm delighted to hear that that's exactly what you're doing. Thank you. Have a good time with Amal. <laughs> that's great. Now let's move to Gawaha Atif. Gawaha, I don't know where you are. Hi, David <clears throat> and everybody. I'm in Cairo. I'm in Egypt. Oh, brilliant. I've been here. Uh, a few weeks and it's my first trip in 18 months. Um, quite a contrast to uh, uh, sleepy Montreal, a city of a million and a bit of people where everybody's wearing masks quite rigorously. Here, the numbers are going up. Everybody uh, is quite concerned. There virtually is not a family I've spoken to uh, and, and people I know, whether they're actually personal family or friends, who, who doesn't have a, a, a COVID story about a member in their family, some end tragically, some not. There, I'm, I'm hearing there's around a thousand cases a day now, which is quite an increase. 
you know, Egypt is a is a big machine, and the Cairo is is the heart of that and soul of that machine. Things are moving. Nobody stopped for COVID either, other than early on. I mean, you, business is booming, restaurants are working. People in the restaurants, the the workers, and in shops wear masks that sometimes tend to slip down a little bit from the nose, and sometimes stay on the chin. Um, so they're aware of the issue, but. Uh, this is a, a country of 7,000 years of history and many pandemics. And that's the only way, way I can explain why things are a little bit less intense uh, uh, than I see in, I've seen in, in Montreal and Canada. It's not really part of the re- rhetoric other than saying, ah, yes, so-and-so has had COVID. And, and, some, and tragically, obviously, they have had a number of deaths and continue to, to do so. Interestingly, the government has taken a very important step to uh, um, request by law that all government workers are vaccinated and all users of government services be vaccinated. And that kicks in, I think there are two dates for that, one in November, one in December, I don't recall the exact dates. And that's actually sending more people to get vaccinated. Vaccines are available. You have the two Chinese vaccines. Uh, There's uh, the Russian vaccine, there's Pfizer, and there's Johnson and Johnson. I don't believe there's Moderna. I haven't heard. So people are increasingly going towards getting their jabs. Yeah. But the numbers are low. Uh, but quite a quite a, a culture shock from Canada, where everybody's following the rules and we're concerned wow. about 400 cases. Yeah. Um, but um, anyways, well, it's interesting to be here. Be careful. Be careful. Always, everybody. I say, even if you've been vaccinated, even Absolutely. more than twice. Do take the precautions. I'm sure you do, actually. I'm I do. Like I do. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you very much, Gawaha. It's Thank always you. lovely to connect with you. Let me, um, here's the, the order I'd like to go in. I'd very much like to hear about, I think it's Beat Maya. Uh, and then afterwards, I'd like to go to Rebecca Cantor. And then after Rebecca, I'd like to go to Jane Badham. So let's see if that works. A uh, beat, please. Yeah, he- hello. My name is Beat Meyer. I'm based in Basel, in Switzerland. So maybe quite a different perspective. And actually, I have two things, two two questions. The uh, the first question relates to what you just have said about you know the the measures to take in Switzerland. We have a certificate uh, uh, where you have to be vaccinated. You have uh, have recovered of the of an illness, or you have to be tested, and then you uh, you can attend. You can go to the cinema, you can go to a restaurant. My question is, how is it within the restaurant? Take, can you take off the mask and, you know, just do as, as you do because everybody has to show the certificate or would you keep it on? So in most countries where this approach is used, the mask is taken off when dining in the restaurant but it's put back on if you get up to move around or to uh, go to use the facilities. The, the waiting staff keep their masks on. This is slightly different from most airlines where you are asked to keep your mask on really all the time, except when actually consuming food. And there's a particular requirement that you remain masked if you talk to the cabin crew. It's quite, there are some various, I'm personally, uh, um, personally believe that sometimes the uh, restaurant situation is perhaps a little bit lax, uh, but I can understand why I think it is because there's increasing worries that if the restrictions are too tight, that that will scare away the customers. So, Beat, is that what you're seeing and hearing? And is that in keeping with what your experience is? Yeah, exactly. So what I recognize in restaurants, if you have the certificate and you can show it and you have to identify yourself, then then it, it's relaxed as well. I, I, really, yes, I recognize that in business meetings as well, that people take them off the mask. You know, if, if they follow this procedure, then uh, they take off the masks and they uh, yes, feel, feel like before COVID. Be like pre-COVID. Of <laughs> so yes, my concern is, is, is it too lax or is it, is it okay? <laughs> you know, that's my well, question. I, always, when in doubt, take the precaution. Please, yes. please, please. It's much better to be careful. 
And may I ask this, the second thing that I, I, uh, I that I entered to the, to the question box in this was a, a recent discussion I have a daughter Sarah she is 18 years old and we had a discussion about COVID and in Switzerland there is some there are some people reluctant to get uh, vaccinated and so we don't get to the threshold level we should get to get fully vaccinated and so my daughter Sarah found um, you know actually. And of course, there is pressure on the young to get vaccinated, and let's say on the people below 25. And she she pointed out to me her point of view that she said, you know, we as well, she as the young as part of the young group, they are pressured to get vaccinated because the the older or well, some of the older part of the people they don't want to get vaccinated. And uh, yes, her her point was that you know. Uh, she feels that the younger population should have the choice to get vaccinated or not, yes. because they 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 would they would suffer the the potential adverse yeah. effects we would not we, which are unknown yet. What do you think about this? Uh, well, it's uh, one of the most difficult issues in vaccination. Quite simply, if you really want to control an infectious disease, the issue is not whether individuals are getting vaccinated, it's whether you have sufficient population immunity to actually stop the spread of the disease. And what many countries are trying to do, including Switzerland, is to get a sufficiently large proportion of the total population vaccinated so that it reduces the amount of virus being transmitted. So your daughter, Sarah, is being asked to get vaccinated, not just for her own good, but for the good of all. Uh, I, I'm, I'm wanting, uh, Bayat, if we could, we could perhaps have a follow-up private email exchange about this, because I'd be very happy to share with you my view. It's, it's quite a tricky issue to navigate if you're a parent, and I would not want you to be trying to advise your daughter on the basis of what I've said now, I'd like to have a further conversation. Um, and I think you know how to get hold of us. Thank you. I'd Thank like you to go to Rebecca, please. Rebecca Cantor, uh, you have the floor. Uh, where, to, where to start? I mean, I never would have thought that Chile would be a really weird test case for a lot of things. Um, because Chile, before I get into the travel issue, Chile started giving boosters in August. I think one of the first countries to give boosters to the whole population based on when you had last gotten your second dose. Um, so it wasn't just really restricted like it is in the US. And they also started vaccinating children um, five and over, I think. They wanted to do th age three and over, but I think it's five and over for now. Whereas those kinds of conversations are just happening in the US, for example, months later. Um, so the, over 80% of the, of the Chilean population has been vaccinated with two doses of different vaccines, primarily Pfizer and um, Sinovac for a while. But so that's why they started giving boosters in August. Now our numbers though have still gone up. So as of yesterday, Chile's restrictions tightened up again. Now, I have a PhD and I can't like, I can't even like figure out now what the new travel restrictions are based on the fact that Chile finally opened their borders um, at the end of July. Like, I just can't keep it straight. And then on top of that, Chile's starting to get off different travel restriction lists in other countries like the UK I mentioned in the chat which is interesting because Chile's had one of the highest vaccination rates in the world since the beginning of the pandemic, which I call endemic. Um, but as I was saying in the chat, to leave the Chilean airport, I need my Chilean mobility pass, which is based on my two doses of Sinovac. But the UK does not accept Sinovac as being a full vaccination course. So the only way I can enter the UK is through my US CDC vaccination card because when Chile's borders finally opened up, I was able to travel back to the US for the first time in also many months. 
and got two more rounds of vaccine, um, sort of as a why not, but not realizing how important that would now be for potential travel. I know other people um, here in Chile also with four vaccine doses. And Chile's now also saying that to keep your mobility pass active, if you're over age 55, you have to get a booster. But what about my friends who are over 55, who have four vaccines, but two of them are from the US? So then they're not honored in the mobility pass. However, I know people who were able to get their mobility pass activated finally um, through antibody tests with their US CDC card. So it's possible that for the booster edition, they'll also honor some sort of additional antibody test. I don't really know. So then the friends I have don't want to get five vaccines, but if the only way they can move around here is to get five vaccines, they're in a weird ethical uh, dilemma. And then Finally, it's just one person, but I know one person who has two doses of Sinovac, one dose of Pfizer as a booster, and then um, needs to travel to the UK because she's from the UK and her son's getting married, and had to get the AstraZeneca because the UK won't honor one dose of Pfizer or two doses of Sinovac. So she just got four, four X'd up as well, which is why also the vaccine plus in the drawing, I'm sorry, it's hard for me to, I know what Josh means, but it's hard for me to look at because I know so many people now that are 4X or 5X potentially getting vax. And I just don't, I just see this playing out. Like, of course, me and the other people I know are privileged sort of expat people, but I just see this playing out as a really weird travel game that I, I can't even fathom how it came to this, but it's come to this. So it's discriminating massively against poorer people and it's giving enormous advantage to people who can work out how to game the system. Some of whom, as you point out, will have five six or more vaccines by the end of this year to try to enable them to travel for work for education for education or for family reasons and uh, it's extremely discriminatory just a, one group that finds this very difficult who i was talking to recently are the diplomats who are representing some of the countries that are, have got these stringent demands they're really in the firing line but there are many people who are who are really troubled at the moment. Um, thank you, Rebecca, for just talking about it like it is. I have no solution, but it Im impels me to try to persuade the representatives of different governments to work together on this with greater urgency than is happening right now. Please, please do, because I, I see also two additional levels of discrimination. One is so many countries aren't accepting Sinovac, but if the WHO accepts Sinovac, then why are we discriminated, discriminating against that pharmaceutical company or vaccine? And then secondly, why aren't other vaccine documents from other countries accepted? It, like, why isn't the US CDC card accepted here in Chile? Do they really think that, you know, we f forged the card I, I mean i agree it's it's better to be serious and, and do the antibody test just to make mm -hmm. sure but at the end of the day as this plays out with travel yeah. um you know the u.s didn't accept my chilean mobility pass to leave the u.s to fly back yeah. to chile like there are so many things uh, that would travel many, and there are many opportunities for rules to change at short notice there's lots of different interpretations just to say, Sinovac and Sinopharm 
are approved by WHO, they are on the WHO emergency use list. And it remains a little bit of a surprise that so many countries and blocks are not accepting certificates with Sinovac and Sinopharm. Very, very strange. Um, everybody, I'd just like to turn to John Atkinson for some final words before we then go to Josh and then Catherine will close us. John, please. Three things, David, on, on thinking about systems. So first, from your graphs, you show us the global graphs. One of the things when we work with systems is to zoom in and zoom out. It's really important to get at, at the sort of local level. Who's got the vaccine? Where is it? Uh, how are they spreading it? What's the what's the transmission? But also to go out to see the big picture as you've shown it. So this zooming in and zooming out is important. On plan A or plan B, whenever we posit an opposite in systems, we're almost always wrong. It's about the tension between them and what's the right space and how do we get into that conversation? So this conversation, is it A or is it B, is always almost always a bad one. And listening to uh, Rebecca, crazy systems like this are almost inevitably not designed to be that way. They're designed, they're the unintended consequences of really caring often and smart people trying to do the right thing each time layer upon layer upon layer and the whole thing ends up in a complete mess so we have to surface these contradictions and make them visible so people just see how crazy it is otherwise they just keep carrying on so three little points on systems david hope that helped and thank you john john atkinson our, our systems leadership uh, mentor and uh, a part of our team in 4ST. Thank you, John, as always, for your observations. Just to say that my engineer friend, uh, Peter, uh, uh, where are you, Peter? Hebert, has just made a point in the chat. And uh, here he is. Uh, and I'm not going to give you the floor because we've run out of time. But Peter has made the point that in some research that was published this week from Imperial College, uh, it's very clear that these vaccines that we have do not consistently stop you from carrying the virus. So you can be vaccinated and you can be well, but you can still be carrying the virus and you can infect others. It does mean that what I said at the beginning is what I want to say and if you can please continue doing all in your power to make certain that you are not transmitting the virus or receiving the virus by wearing a well-fitted surgical mask and avoiding breathing in the air exhaled by others coughed by others sung by others, sneezed by others, just want to avoid it. And that's why we call for physical distancing. And that's why, in addition, we ask for good hygiene when you're coughing or sneezing. It really matters. Uh, can I, uh, Catherine, would you just like to take us on the last bit? And then we, we, we're late, so we must go. Absolutely. Josh, would you mind putting your illustration up for us? Sure thing. I think you can see it there. I'm still, as usual, kind of running behind, uh, but trying to catch up uh, desperately and frantically. Uh, but uh, I've added a few more things. You can see I've put in the top right hand corner a uh, little scene of New York City. I was very interested in that scenario uh, that was described. So I'm trying to draw up um, the kind of anti-vax protesters and the civil servants all kind of in the mix together and show what's going on there this kind of this uh this kind of split between doing the right thing and this kind of misinformation that's going on that's leading people to do other kinds of actions and um and then somebody else is holding up a, a vaccine passport um in the bottom right hand corner and i'm gonna i'm getting around to drawing up that point that was made about the kind of um, the disparity and the unfairness uh, that we're hearing uh, that, un that it's not very evenly handed uh, the way people are dealing with the vaccine mm. passports and, and the ability to move mm. freely um, uh, mm. and safely. So uh, there's still more to come, but uh, I'm trying to capture all the points as they come in, as you can see. Thanks. Mm. 
Um, no, I the vaccine. I the, I love the yellow taxi. Um, but the vaccine passports, I think, is is great. Um, and and the fact that you continue to work on these after the OOB is over is we're we're so grateful. These are such an incredible help to us. And I know that um, this. Not, I am not alone in downloading them and using them in various other areas as well. Um, well, I think for me. That is the end of a Friday afternoon. For some of you, it's the beginning of a Friday. For others of you, it's a Friday evening. I wanna say thanks to everybody. Thanks again to Global Goals Cast for being here. Live illustration UK as always.